Welcome in, everyone. Hey, everybody. This is Everything Sucks, Let's Fix It, episode 17. My name is Ben Mayer. My name is Anthony Buono. This is take two that we are <laughs> recording. We did just talk for about 10 minutes about our first current event, and we're going to do it again. Because Ben forgot to hit the record button. Yep. All my fault. I deserve the blame. Um, <laughs> we, we're talking about the government shutdown. Yeah. That's... Uh, that seems to be on the brink of happening. Uh, The deadline is October 1st, and it does not seem like McCarthy is going to be able to get his ducks in order Mm -mm. and drag the Freedom Caucus along the line by their heels, okay? They're kicking, they're screaming, and McCarthy can't hold them together. Um, Recently, earlier in the week, McCarthy met with Representative Scott Perry. Now, Scott Perry is the head of the Freedom Caucus. He leads this rebellious fringe wing of populist the, yes of the republican party and he comes to mccarthy they're in the room they're arguing and they finally come to a deal and the deal from my perspective is exactly what the freedom caucus wants scott perry negotiates an eight percent cut to all discretionary spending that doesn't have to do with defense also implements an array of republican border policies which is such a huge political issue right now it, it's beautiful. It looks like a House Freedom Caucus wish list. Exactly. And right after the deal was made, comes out of the room, minutes later, a bunch of members of the Freedom Caucus say, hell no. Andy Briggs, Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, the whole gang say, hell no, I'm not into it. Matt Rosendale, who's running for Senate in Nevada, uh, in Montana, hell no, I'm not doing it. What more do they want? Yes. It's funny because this 8% cut is already laughable. And Schumer... Uh, in the Senate already called the plan reckless and not a serious proposal for avoiding a shutdown because this obviously could never pass the Senate in any form close to what it's being proposed as. And these Freedom Caucus members are coming out against it because it's not extreme enough. So even though this bill is already silly, they're like, we want to make it even sillier. It's like whenever McCarthy decides that he wants to do something, even if it's in the Freedom Caucus's favor, they then decide, you know what, that's not crazy enough, or that's not far right enough. Yes, McCarthy has somehow gotten painted as establishment, which has made it simply impossible for the Republicans to govern in the House. And this happens to every single Republican House Speaker. This isn't new. This happened This happened to uh, uh, the guy under... John Boehner? Yes, thank you. Happened to John Boehner, happened to Paul Ryan, yep. it's happening to Kevin McCarthy. Mm-hmm. This is the Republican playbook of the far right. This is how they get what they want. Interesting theoretical question. Yes. If uh, if a Republican populist became the speaker, how would the centrist Republicans respond? I think they would fall in line real quick, to be honest. Really? Yeah, because they would get the majority of what they want. And I think that they are they they know how to play politics well in the House Freedom Caucus. I don't okay. think the House Freedom Caucus knows how to say yes. Interesting. That's my issue with them. Or okay. that, that's my that's my largest political. I have plenty of critiques of them, but that's my political critique of them. Mm, as like, far as like their functioning of their strategies like they don't know how to say yes when they want mm. they only know how to say no and scream and cry they don't know how to govern okay and uh mike lawler uh representative from new york who was in a biden plus 10 biden plus 15 district he said that it is lunacy to expect this type of bill to pass in the house and then get passed in the senate and then be signed by President Biden. He's like, we need to recognize that we have a Democrat Senate, a Democrat presidency, and we need to start thinking about how to make the government function. And he's complaining that when you elect lunatics, you get a lunatic government. And that's what we're in right now. That's a Republican saying that. It it sounds a lot like what Nikki Haley said about abortion in the debate. True. Like we're not, it makes no sense to propose these federal bans because we have a democratically controlled Senate and we're definitely not going to get 60 Senate seats and Mm -hmm. beat them on the filibuster. So why are we even proposing these things? And see, so that's what tells me that these centrist Republicans know how to play politics better. Yeah. Right? Because they know. They're not stupid. Mm -hmm. And so... And the, the, the Republicans in the Senate have totally washed their hands. We have John Corn in Texas. He says, if House Republicans can't agree on a spending patch, then it looks like we're heading to a shutdown. So Senate Republicans are like, okay, guys, if the House Republicans can't figure it out, then we're heading to a shutdown. We're done with this. We are not attached to them. This is their fault. This yeah. has nothing to do with us. Because the, the Republicans in the Senate have honestly been hurt and hindered by the House Freedom Caucus crazies 
during the 2022 midterms. Yeah. So many of them pulled Senate candidates down at the top of the ballot. And they don't want to do the hard work of actually trying to pull these Freedom Caucus Republicans into the coalition. So they're like, they're not us. Stay away. Exactly. But you know what? That, that's interesting because maybe they don't even view them as being in their coalition. Like maybe they don't even want to own them. This reminds me. So other piece of news isn't on our sheet. Mitt Romney announced he's going to retire. Yes. I don't know if you saw this interview with The Post or at least not. some highlights with it. No. Um, he talked about how Senate Republicans, when Trump was in office, would welcome him in and be extremely respectful to him and then listen to him talk or exchange words with him and then as soon as he left the room they would burst out laughing wow and this seems very similar to that for me that's exactly how i feel about it too yeah that that's exactly that that is that is showing that the senate republicans don't view these people as serious Mm -hmm. and honestly i don't think they deserve to be looked at as serious they don't have serious demands i don't think they have serious critiques Mm mm-hmm um, I think they're just contrarians and they're populists and they don't know what to yell at, but they're out there yelling at the sky every day. Totally. And uh, they, they don't know how to say yes to anything. Yeah. You know, they have an 8% cut here on the table. Why would they not take that? What it, a win that could be. Yeah, that's the crazy thing. It means they're thinking about 15, right? And that's that's absurd. And 8% isn't even getting it close to what's making it. So what we talked about in take one is that I think at least the Democrats will eventually come in Mm -hmm. after McCarthy starts going for the lane or stops going for the lane of trying to fit these Freedom Caucus members into his coalition. And we're going to get an agreement that's similar to what we got out of the debt ceiling bill in the spring, where even though it might look a little bit like a political win for McCarthy, effectively... Democratic spending is mostly going to be preserved. I agree that that's what's going to end up happening to avoid the government shutdown, but I don't think McCarthy survives that. Really? I think the Freedom Caucus votes to vacate. Maybe, but again, someone has to replace. But someone has to replace maybe, but then he won't, then they'll just put the whole house in standstill. They'll vote to vacate him, right? You only need one member to, to, to put in a vote to vacate All the Democrats will vote to vacate McCarthy. Then you only need like four Republicans to vote to vacate and McCarthy's out of power. That's true. And then they could just keep doing that forever. But again, you like a replacement would need to be there. Why? At some point. But but the Freedom Caucus doesn't even want the government to function. Their dream would be to shut down the House of Representatives forever. I think, could. I think Democrats would step in. You think, but but who? What Republican is going to vote with the Democrats? I can imagine there's three, but what happens? You, Hakeem Jeffries becomes Speaker. No, 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 no. no. There to will bail be out McCarthy. Some Democrats, yeah. No, the Democrats Saban. will never bail out McCarthy. Democrats might might pick a consensus a consensus Republican, like Bacon from Nebraska, but McCarthy doesn't survive this. If, they're not gonna they're not gonna let McCarthy stay in power after this. If that's true, then I'm. I, I would be extremely disappointed with Democrats. Really? You think the Democrats should prop up McCarthy? I don't think McCarthy is a good speaker. Obviously, Obviously, I don't want him to that have that position, but I think it's better for there to be a speaker yeah. than for there not to be. And I think the Democrats then become just as guilty as playing stupid, unproductive politicking if they don't step in and do something to make that the case. There is another interpretation that Democrats can say, look, the House has been shut down for all this time because Republicans can't get their head in order and you can't elect them to government because they don't know how to function it. But that's the that's what I'm saying. Even if it's a political win right. for the Democrats, it's it's not an effective win. It's not right. a policy win. Like yes. we we want the government to be governing. Yes. I just don't know if they're going to, I don't know if they would ever be okay. I mean, we, that, listen, that's another bridge we have to cross when we get there. But yeah. I, do, I do think there will be a vote to vacate the chair. Okay. I, I, they're, I, they actually found, Matt Gates has drafted a vote to vacate, and one of, a reporter found it on the bathroom floor, not the bathroom floor, but on the bathroom next to the sink, written by Matt Gates, already ready to go. So wow. it, it is already out there. Like, he has it prepped. He just needs to submit it. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Also, so funny that, like, dude, the, the, it, this thing to vote to vacate the chair was yeah. on a, no, you know what it was? It was on a ch- diaper changing table. Interesting. That's where it was in the bathroom. I just think that's so funny. Yeah, that is funny. 
makes Jake, me think of Jake Sullivan reported that. So if that's fake news, blame Jake Sullivan. Don't blame me. Jake Sullivan, I trust. Yeah, Jake Sullivan's awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, let's let's move on to, off the government shutdown here. Okay. We 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 tap that whole thing out, man. We just needs to see where McCarthy goes. Yeah. Um, where do you want to go to next? I think we should go to the UAW strike. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah, dude. So our, our summer slash fall of union activity continues. And it's just great to see. It's I'm, amazing. I'm a, we're big union guys. Yeah. We love to see union organizing and we love to see workers fighting for their rights like this. And it's awesome to see such a massive fixture of the working class really take up arms against the established CEOs like this. It's really funny. I don't know if I haven't, if there's actually more union activity than normal, or if it's just that I'm paying more attention to political activity than normal. Yeah, it, it, there has been an uptick in union activity, no doubt. It's not as crazy as people seem. Like the amount of workers that are in, in the United States that are in a union in the private sector hasn't really increased, mm. but there's just been more strikes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. Which is cool because th- I think that's the pretext of it. I think how union activity starts growing and unions spread is you get the union striking, you get some positive press in the media, and then people think, okay, maybe I should join a union too. Sure. Right. Okay. Um, but let, let's give a little bit of the groundwork here. So what is uh, the UAW fighting for? And what is the UAW? So the United Auto Workers Union uh, is... Everyone who builds a car in the United States, if you're working for Chrysler, you're working for Ford, you're working for Stellaris. Stellantis. Stellantis. It's every union worker who builds a car. Yes. Yeah. And these guys um, have been a fixture of the American working class since the 30s, 40s, 50s. If you think like 1950s middle class, one income, one car, one vacation a year, it's because of the UAW, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, the quintessential. Exactly. Uh, and now they are fighting for better economic conditions, what unions are supposed to do. Uh, they recently had an election and elected the new president, Sean Fain. And Sean Fain has, was on the campaign trail running for union president as a militant proponent of really impressive demands. And so this is what they are fighting for. They are fighting for a 36 to 40% wage increase over four years. Mm -hmm. We're currently the full-time employees at the big three. That's um, Chrysler, Ford, and Stellantis. Uh, The the average full-time employee makes 18 to $32 an hour. They want that increase 36%. Um, Really quick, I'm going to correct you because Stellantis, you said Ford, Chrysler, Stellantis. Oh yeah, please correct me. Chrysler turned into Stellantis. So it's Ford, Stellantis, and GM. Thank you, because I would have kept saying it. Yeah. Ford, Stellantis, GM. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So they want a 36% wage increase until over the next four years to 2027. They want an end to the tiered employment system. Now, what is this tiered employment system? Uh, This means that newer workers work for lower pay and less benefits, and it encourages these companies to bring on temporary workers so that they and they can keep them in the lowest tier and not have as many full-time workers Mm -hmm. they also want to lower the work week to 32 hours a week instead of 40 Mm -hmm. which is awesome because that is the beginning of the four-day work week you want to talk about how we get a four-day work week in america it's the same way we got the five-day work week through union organizing Mm. every time you have a saturday or sunday off thank a union because the only reason you have that is because union workers uh, striked for it when it wasn't easy. And now they're doing that for the four day work week. Um, so these are the three big demands. And well, 40% sounds like a lot, right? Yeah. When you're, when you're thinking about wage increases, most people get 2% a year, 3% a year. They're asking for 36 to 40% over four years. Why is this absolutely justified in my view? So I want to give a little bit of background into what happened over the last decade that makes this strike so genuinely important. So in 2008, these car companies were losing billions of dollars, were hemorrhaging money, were almost edging towards bankruptcy, mm-hmm. specifically Chrysler and GM. Ford was kind of not there yet. Yeah, well, they they did go bankrupt. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Before, GM and Chrysler did. Yes. Ford edged near it. Mm-hmm. And then in order to get money from the federal government, the auto bailout, the unions were in the conversation and the company said, listen, you guys have to make cuts. Mm-hmm. You guys have to change your demands 
and change the contract. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to function yeah. and Congress won't give us the money. And the union still wanted that. They they wanted to make cuts because it still did mean that the unions could save jobs. Absolutely. So it in, they introduced these lower tiers that had fewer protections and fewer wage guarantees. But the problem is they never went back after 2008. They never went back. And you can see that in how their salaries have kept up with inflation over time. Mm-hmm. So they all... they. The, the union workers, the UAW said, okay, you know what, we will change our cost of living increases, just cut those out, and we'll deal with that at the next contract. Well, because of that, um, those who work on the direct production of cars have seen a 20% decrease in their effective wages. Those who work on the parts of cars make 10% less than what they did in 2008. So we see a 10% reduction, a 20% reduction in wages. So when these guys are fighting for a 36, 40% increase, they're actually just going back to the cost of living increases from 2008. They're just trying to make up for all that lost time Mm -hmm. where they let Ford, GM, Stellantis rake in a ton of money without ever distributing it back to the workforce. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also happens to be right in line with the increases to salaries that executives of those same companies collected while decreasing the pay of the manufacturing workers underneath them. These CEOs are making 350 times what the average worker is making. Yeah. That's insanity. In the 1970s, we were like, the CEOs were paid, I think, 40 to 50% times the average worker. Now it's 350. Is that sustainable? Is that right? No, it's not right. And when we see uh, these CEOs of Ford go on the news and talk about how they're in trouble and they try to defend their salaries of 29, 30 million dollars a year. And they're like, when I succeed, everyone succeeds. When the worker succeeds, everyone succeeds. Mm-hmm. When the worker shows up every day and builds the car, that's what gets you your salary too. This is a partnership. This isn't like a, this isn't the CEO making all the value here. Mm. And that, that gets me upset when the CEO goes on TV and thinks okay. that they are the ginormous piece of the puzzle. See, I have a I have a different perspective because I, I I understand where the CEO is coming from mm-hmm. for their own selfish like like gain. Yes. Right. And from like from all of our own perspectives, the we we want more for ourselves, for our tribe, for our people, for our families, right? So I I don't really blame the CEOs because to me, they're just acting, they're just optimizing their own performance within the system that we've set up. Oh, that's so true. But this is why the unions are so important because this is how you balance the system. This is why negotiations and striking is the right way to do it because the CEO should be trying to get everything he wants, right? The CEO should be trying to get as much money for himself and his family. That's what we expect. We expect him to want the best quality of life, but... There's only a problem if he can act tyrannically over all of his workers and completely siphon any high quality of life from them. If we give the power to the unions, we can create this balance of power so the CEO doesn't have this enormously disproportionately better life and everyone can adequately share in the wealth of the company. That's beautifully said. And, and the company currently, let's be very clear, is making so much money. Mm. In 2022 and 2023, these companies were making record profits, $37 billion in 2022 mm-hmm. and $33 billion in 2023. Yeah. Not only were they making so much money, the way that they decided to spend their money also indicates their true priorities. In 2022, $10 billion were spent on stock Buybacks. Yep. 2023, it has been $14 billion. Already. 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 That's insane. It it's and I dug into this a little bit. It's interesting because the graph we have on our screen right now, we kind of see profits. Uh, they go, they oh, go. Wait, no, up it's and, not already. It's a 2023 forecast. Oh, okay. Yeah. Never mind. Good to know. Um, they go up a little bit from 2013 to like 2015, 2016. Then they start coming back down a little bit for COVID. Yes, and then in in 2020 they they bottom, but then they spike enormously, massively. And so what happens is during COVID there are enormous supply chain issues, right? And cars can't get built as easily, but because of that, companies can raise their prices. They can do it with some kind of rationale behind it, right? So people aren't 
necessarily mad at the company or they're not looking at that price and being like, that's absolutely ridiculous. I would never spend that on a car. Instead, they're thinking it costs more to make this car. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that I have to spend more to make this car. The issue is the companies can now capitalize on that being the new norm. And that's what has continued happening. Even as supply chains have normalized, cars have been, or these companies have decided to make fewer low-end cars, to make fewer high-end cars even, so that they're making fewer cars overall, but they're kind of, they're cutting out the low-end cars more and more often. So even though they're producing less and they're selling fewer cars, their profit margins are so much higher that their profit has been spiking. So this is obviously bad for the workers because like there are fewer cars to create, um, and it's kind of compounded this issue where you have more profits, even though it's less work. It's like the definition of rent seeking. Yeah. And now what's so frustrating is when profits skyrocket at these companies, the workers don't see any of it. Mm-hmm. And there needs to be some type of balance between the profit a company makes and the benefits a worker earns because the company makes no profits. The workers don't show up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And sure, the workers have no jobs if the company isn't there, but it's about this mutual relationship that needs to be respected. Mm -hmm. And right now, these massive car companies are not respecting it. They're not respecting it. Um, And this also comes in a big moment where we're shifting from gasoline combustion engines now over to electric vehicles. And these car companies view this transition as, oh man, this is our chance to get rid of all of these unions. Yep. They view this as, oh, we can get rid of all of these expensive guys who have to build combustion engines, and we can go and replace them with the lot easier, lot cheaper tasks of building and, and, and assembling batteries, right? Mm-hmm. This is what the focus is of the unions now. The unions are pulling in, um, is pulling in the electric vehicle workers into this deal and is ready to make the transition of the uaw from combustion engines into the electric vehicle market and making sure that this is still a foreseeable path to the middle class that it once was yes totally that their rights and their wages are protected exactly um yeah so as i was saying because there are fewer parts in electric cars um, there can, there has to, there doesn't necessarily ha- have to be as many workers. So a favorable outcome for the UAW would also give them a, uh, a, oh man, hold on. Where am I right now, dude? I'm so pissed. You're fine. Ugh. So these companies, okay, here we go. Yeah. Oh, geez. These com- okay. These companies are now building these electric vehicles in states that do not have good union protections. Yep. They're building them in the South where they have right to work laws. There, uh, a lot of them are, you know, Tesla is a very famous anti-union company, right? Yep. And in Texas. Yes, Arizona, in Texas, Arizona. These, yeah. So these, the transition is not becoming union and they are fighting to keep these jobs in the Midwest where the UAW has more clout. And the UAW is actually pretty mad at Biden for this. Mm. They're pretty mad at Biden that Biden gave a ton of money to these companies and or not necessarily to these companies but he made a lot of ev electric vehicle incentives in the inflation reduction act without union guarantees Mm. so they're actually kind of pissed that they don't feel like the biden administration is gracefully handing over the uaw tradition down to the electric vehicle market where are you at on that what's your take what's your opinion i think biden could totally have done more really through the ira I definitely think would it have I don't I mean I think that he definitely could have done more. I think his National Labor Relations Board is obviously the strongest that we've seen ever. Mm. Biden has come out and he has said that he is in favor of basically in favor of the strike. He yeah. has repeated Sean Fain's um uh slogan of record profits mean record contracts. Mm-hmm. He came out and he said that explicitly. Yeah. So he's obviously in favor of the UAW movement here. Um, but I think he could have done more on a legislative and policy level. You See, don't think he could? Well, my perspective is the dollars in the Inflation Reduction Act are all going to incentivize more EV production. Mm-hmm. And the problem is the dollars that would necessarily need to be spent extra on union labor now can be spent instead on quickening 
the transition to EVs. We're doing the second part of a climate change deep dive today. Mm -hmm. And you know my perspective is kind of that that climate change is the end-all be-all. It's the White Walkers. Yeah. It's the biggest thing. So I, as as important as keeping these jobs within unions are, I fret about thinking that we might decrease productivity by taking some of the money away from companies that otherwise would be better incentivized to produce more EVs. I don't know. I don't think that it would be that related. Honestly, I don't. No. I think a very I think a very simple shift in the Inflation Reduction Act's language could be um, your ta tax credit for buying a electric vehicle is maybe a thousand dollars. If it's a union made electric vehicle, it's fourteen hundred dollars. Okay. You see what I mean? Okay, so this is for the, on the consumer end. It's all on the consumer end. Oh. Yes. So the the electric vehicle tax credits are on the consumer end. Okay. So when you go and buy an electric vehicle, your tax rebate, your tax refund mm -hmm. is you get a thousand dollars. Sure. So I'm saying if you buy an, a union vehicle, mm -hmm. a union electric vehicle, it would be fourteen hundred. But if you buy a Tesla that's not union made, you only get a thousand. Okay. I think I'm I'm cool with that. So that's what I'm saying. Where Biden could have done something a little differently. Mm -hmm. Now. This doesn't mean that the UAW is anti-Biden. This doesn't mean that they are super against Biden. Mm. They might be a little upset, but the UAW has made it very, very, very clear that um, they are not supportive of any type of Republican administration at all. So uh, Donald Trump is trying to get some political headwind on this, mm -hmm. and he's trying to make it seem like the electric vehicle scam is going to destroy the United Auto Workers, and that he's blaming the Biden administration for the transition to electric vehicles, and he's blaming that as the source of all the union's problems. That's not true. That's not what the union's demands are. The union's demands are not to keep gasoline vehicles. The, the, auto, the United Auto Workers are actually very, very concerned about the stability and the sanctity of our environment. And they don't want to see it destroyed. They want to transition to electric vehicles. They want it to be a just transition. Um, so when Trump comes out and he says that they're being sold down the drain by this electric car scam, uh, this is Sean Fain's response. Every fiber of our union is being poured into fighting the billionaire class and an economy that enriches people like Donald Trump at the expense of the workers, Fain said. We can't keep elect, uh, electing billionaires and millionaires that don't have any understanding what it is like to live paycheck to paycheck and struggle to get by and expecting them to solve the problems of the working class. Where's this guy? Why doesn't he run for president? Yeah. What is this guy doing? Hey, Sean Fain, when you're done as your tenure as the United Auto Workers Union president. Yeah. Go run for president, dude. It, please. It, it really does not get much clearer than that. I think regarding Biden, he said this isn't about the president. So to me, the vibe I'm getting is he doesn't want either party to try to mooch off them, right? To try to take any credit for what happens. He's like, this is our thing. By, and, and the Biden administration has been trying to help, mm -hmm. right? Julie Sue, who I think is a member of the Department of Commerce. Um, no, she's the Secretary of Labor. Secretary of Labor? She's okay. the acting Secretary of Labor. Okay. Um, they He was planning on sending her there, but I read a, an article actually just this morning saying she hadn't made it into town. So she's not going to the picket lines, but she is involved in the negotiation conversation. She's like a mediator right now. Is she? I've heard that she has been at least facilitating conversations. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if she is or if she wants to be. Oh, okay. Is the thing. I don't know because I know the Biden administration has offered their help in any ways that they can to move the conversations along because another wrinkle of this is just how important the UAW is to the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. There's an expectation that the economy could lose up to $5 billion if this strike goes for, I think, four weeks is the estimate. Mm -hmm. Uh so the Biden administration has a big incentive to get these talks moving, to get this deal done. But I don't know if Sean Fain and his team really want their help. Yeah, I mean, I, and I, I like the idea of not making the labor strike political. Yeah. I agree with that. I think labor actions should be what they are, labor actions. Mm -hmm. The politicians who want to get involved and want to help and they want to be 
genuine about that help, please get involved. Grab grab a sign. Be like Bernie Sanders, who goes down and gives a speech with Sean Fain, right? Mm-hmm. Be like Ro Khanna, who walks the picket line. Don't virtue signal and... Act like you care about the plights of the working class and that you want to see these workers take on corporations and then be like, "Mm, I think they're asking for a little too much. Oh, they're just lazy. They don't want to work five days a week. Oh, they want to return to pension programs and step away from 401ks. That's a little selfish of them. Mm. You're not pro-union. Don't. Don't, don't, Don't be disingenuous about it. Say it with your chest and say it proud. So that's what gets me mad. With Donald Trump right now, and it gets me frustrated because he's trying to muddy the waters and make union workers think that he has their back when he never has and he never will. Mm. Sean Fain said it, great, but Donald Trump appointed terrible people to the NLRB. He had an awful Secretary of Labor. He did nothing to beef up. Union elections were at an all-time low, were near an all-time low when Donald Trump was president because he handicapped the entire institution of the NLRB and how to operate elections. Mm. He So he is not an ally to unions, and now he's going to Detroit on September 27th to give a big speech in front of 500 union workers and I, I can't wait to watch it because what can he say? He's not going to come out and support a four-day work week. He's not come. He, he's not going to come out and talk about the rising wages. No. He never talked about it once. You know what he's going to say? He's going to say, "I love unions. I was the best president ever for unions. I want you guys to win." He's going to give a bunch of vague platitudes, as he always does. As he always does, and as he always will. And it makes me so frustrated because these unions are fighting for very, very specific things. Right? Mm-hmm. They want. They want. This is one of my favorite things. For retirement benefits, okay, full-time hired after 2007, they get 401k accounts with a 6.7% company contribution. All workers before 2007 had a guaranteed pension program. They gave up a pension program in the 2008 recession. These workers gave up everything to keep Ford, GM, and Stellantis alive. Mm -hmm. They gave up everything. They gave up their secured retirement, and now they want to get that secured retirement back But a lot of politicians don't care, and they make it very obvious they don't care. Mm. Tim Scott has come out, and he said that he would follow Ronald Reagan's example and fire all of them and rehire everyone. Wow. Nikki Haley said that when you have a president like Joe Biden out there spitting unions, 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 this is what you get. And she basically says the same thing as Tim Scott. Fire them all and rehire. That's what these Republicans want. So it's just so important that that veil is pulled down and Mm. that they can't hide from it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't want them to be able to hide from it. Yes. They're very clearly anti-union. Yes. And so what I love about this strike is that the way it's organized is brilliant. So they're they're doing this strategy called a stand-up strike. Mm. Now, what is a stand-up strike? This is where workers are called to walk out at specific locations and designated by their union rather than all members striking at once. So the union is picking specific locations around the country to strike at specific times so that they can either increase the amount of strikes over time and boost their leverage and keep the companies guessing on where they're going to pop up next. Mm. So right now there are striking in Missouri, Ohio, and Michigan. And in total, we're looking at 13,000 workers in the United States currently on strike. Um, if all the workers in the UAW went on strike, that would be 1,500 workers. No, I'm sorry, 150,000 workers. Wow. That would be one of the biggest in the United States history. Um, so, and now, what's also cool about this is it's getting international solidarity. Yeah. So, in Italy, uh, I think it's Stellantis that has branches out in Italy. And uh, workers at one of the suppliers there protested today a walk-off and walked off the job for eight hours in protest um, because of the issues going on in the United States and internal transparency problems about new models that will be built in the factory. So we can see uh, unions in Italy following after the uh, after the UAW in the United States and showing solidarity there. Not just that, also in Canada, the Unifor, uh, Unifor, whatever, National President Lana Payne said in a video posted on the union's website that Ford needed to do more to meet members' expectations and demand. If there is a strike, this will be a total strike, she said, and every single one of Unifor's 5,600 members at Ford in Canada will be on the picket lines. So this could be coordinated over different countries now, Yeah, which is awesome international solidarity among the working class. This is amazing. Really cool. Um, And I, I like to imagine that they're all in 
communication, talking about how they're going to do this, right? Oh, I'm sure they are. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I love the idea of the stand-up strike mm. because so many successful strike techniques end up becoming illegal. So okay. a, a really, a really, a really strong um, example of one of this is the solidarity strike. So if a union goes on strike, back in the past, in the 30s and in the 20s, you, unions of other sectors would go on strike and support. So if the Teamsters went on strike, the UAW went on strike, mm. not necessarily for their own contract demands, but to help the Teamsters get over the road too. Okay. Put the whole country in a spiral so that the presidents had to get involved. Sure. Now, you're not allowed to do that anymore. It's illegal. Mm. It's illegal in the U.S. So... Well, watch out in the next couple of years. Maybe stand-up strikes might be the next Republican hatchet job. They might come after. They might come up for, after stand-up strikes if this proves to be successful. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to say about the UAW? I don't think so. We covered the the total economic potential effect. Oh, the it could put Michigan in a recession. Effect. If yeah. they go on total strike, we're talking about Michigan being in a recession, which is not something that I want. But what I like what Sean Fain said. He's like, I'm not ruining. We're not ruining the economy. We're ruining, we're, we're ruining the billionaire's economy, mm -hmm. right? We're ruining the way that billionaires make a ton of money. We're not wrecking our economy because yeah. it's not even ours because they're the ones soaking up all the profits. Well, I, still, I don't know. I don't really agree with that. No, I don't think that's entirely true. It's still it's less money true. moving around in the economy. Yes. Like, that's the point. Yes. Uh, it's, it's a nice sound bite. Right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you come to this show for uh, more in-depth analysis, I guess, right? Probably. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Um, last thing I'll say on it is if you want to help the UAW, which I really hope you all do, uh, go to the UAW.org website and sign the all in with the UAW petition on there and then share it on your social media. Uh, if you have a lot of balls, call 1-318-300-1249 to leave a message for the CEOs of Ford, GM, and Stellantis and tell them UAW members deserve the same 40% raises that they got over the, uh, that that they got over the last 4 years and then go to uaw.org for the latest news on the fight to make things right at the big 3. You can sign up for text things. I get texts whenever new negotiation things come on. So uh, I recommend you all go do that to support. Absolutely. I've already made a couple phone calls so you should too. Nice. There you go. Yeah. All right. That's the UAW, baby. Mm -hmm. That was like a mini deep dive, I feel like. Yeah, it was. That was good. That yeah. was a lot. That was solid. I want to move on to CPI report. Let's do it. Um, because there is some connection here. So CPI report came out, I don't know, last week. Um, the 15th. Fairly recently. It was kind of a little bit worse than expected. Like, a little bit. Like inflation was a few a few fractions of a percentage point higher than some experts predicted prices overall went up 3.7 percent year over year in august it was 0.6 percent up from july to august now that's the largest it's been in a year yeah 0.6 is the largest month over month increase over the last year which is concerning you don't want to see inflation at 0.6 but when you dig deeper it's not that scary yeah it's not the core inflation which if you've watched any of our other cpi report segments you know what the fed and kind of is the the more defining characteristic of inflation is core inflation because it strips out food and energy which are really volatile the majority of this month's inflation came from higher energy prices. Russia and OPEC cut off, or they, they reduced some of their oil production because they wanted to raise prices, and that's exactly what happened. So all en takes. energy inflation was about half of the inflation that happened the past month. Besides that, something that I found really interesting was uh, car insurance inflation went up, I think it was like, 2.4%, something like that. It was one of the other biggest line items as far as the month over month inflation. And I was curious about why exactly this is. And it turns out it relates to the conversation we just had where these rising profit margins on vehicles means that insurance companies need to charge more because if they're going to replace cars, then they're going to be with more expensive cars. So insuring these cars, and this kind of makes sense, right? That insurance inflation is going to trail a little bit behind the actual car price inflation. Mm -hmm. So that's what's kind of hitting now. It's contributing to the overall number. It's also to me a perfect example of why inflation is not 
always a money supply thing. Like yeah. this is this is just executives who want to reduce the supply and thus prices go up. Yeah, I feel like this is the perfect nail in the coffin for monetarists if you're actually paying attention to the news. Yeah. Like monetarists believe that the only thing that affects inflation is the amount of money in the system. That's like obviously not true because when we just reduce the amount of oil in the system, we saw inflation. Yes. Supply so clearly has an effect. Uh, yeah. So besides that, like the other big items that I found, there were a few food items that inflated a lot that I don't have an explanation for. F- jet fuel was actually like double the amount of inflation as car insurance wow. because oil. Oh, um, right, yeah. So it's almost entirely oil. Uh, I don't, I'm not worried. I do think the Fed might raise rates again. They could. It, I, I'm like I'm like 50 50. I think they're going to keep it at what they are or what they're at right now. And okay. I think the concern on Wall Street is that they keep it here for too long. Sure. Um, I think that's their concern right now. Because again, what the Fed watches is core inflation and core inflation has gone down. And it actually went down at a larger rate than it has over the last four months. Yeah. Like this is one of the fastest rates of dropping in the core inflation. So they're actually pretty good. What you want to see on month over month inflation is 0.16. 0.16 is what you want your month over month inflation to be. Mm. So when we go down the list, food, it's at 0.2. All right, nice. All items, less food and energy. What are we at? We're at 0.3. All right. So it's double 0.16. Not good. No. But that's like, that's like basically where you want to be. But then when you go to energy, what is it? Energy? 5.6 month over month. Okay, yeah. well, there you go. There's your big problem here. And, you know, as we get a greener economy, this number starts mattering less and less and less. Mm-hmm. As we deal with the war in Ukraine, and then not even to mention the coups happening in Western Africa, the coup in Gabon over the last couple of weeks, the Gabon, Gabon, whatever, yeah. is one of the largest oil producing nations it's the second smallest member of opec but it still produces a ton of oil um the ceo of the largest oil company there says that their production hasn't been affected by the coup i don't buy that for a second Mm. i don't buy that for a second you're just crunching through a coup okay i highly doubt that all your supply chains have very very easily survived all that yeah so all of the political instability in western africa is going to inflate and deal with uh energy prices but what the fed knows because they know this is that their raising interest rates is not going to help oil prices. <laughs> yeah. They're, it's not going to help oil prices. The only thing that Fed raising rates can do is affect asset prices. So when we talk about housing, mm-hmm. right, that's what's gonna, that is going to be directly affected yes. with this. And we see housing starting to slow. And that's what uh, Chairman Powell said a long time ago. He's like, our goal is shelter. The, the, what we are looking at is shelter. And we said a long time on the show that shelter is going to be one of those things that actually takes a long time to get into the effects of, uh, show the effects of the interest rate hikes because mm-hmm. people sign leases to yes. apartments. People have fixed rate mortgages. People have variable rate mortgages that may only change uh, every couple financial quarters. Mm-hmm. So these are things that take time to implement. We now see that the rises in interest rates are doing their job. Yeah, I think, I think I, I'm hoping they keep rates as they are because the trend is still downward and hopefully these housing price results continue to trickle in. The only unfortunate thing is core inflation still is over 4%, yeah. right? And they're looking, they're aiming for that 2% number. So they really do need to watch this decline continue steadily. Otherwise, the rates are going to keep going up. Yeah. And the, the president of Moody's has tweeted out something recently that I thought was really interesting. Out of nowhere, he says that the target for inflation is 2.5%. And every one of the comments is like, no, it isn't. Like, it, it's been 2% forever. Interesting. Why would you say it's 2.5%? And I honestly think that they're going to make us normalize to 2.5. Cool. Is it? Is it not? I don't know. I don't know if it's cool or not. I don't know if I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I have an opinion on it. I just think, I think the 2% inflation is going to be a little bit of the thing in the past as America now reorients reorientates its supply chains it, it reorients was the right word reorients yeah what did i say you said reorient you said reorients and then you corrected yourself to say reorientates is it reorientates not a word no i don't think so maybe i'm right anyways i said cool <laughs> because i don't care oh because i don't think 2.5 versus 2 as the goal for inflation is going to affect anything yeah. besides maybe keeping interest rates 
at their low, low rate of like 5.5 or 6% yeah, yeah, yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, I totally get that. So, um, But now, since we have the CPI report for August, we can tell you what real wages have been. So last week, we talked about the jobs report, and we saw ra- wage increases uh, go 4.5% up. Mm-hmm. We have inflation at 37 so that means we have real wage increases of 0.7% year over year. So wages are still outpacing inflation as of the month of August. And if you account for core inflation, not uh, the, uh, not the uh, CPI, wages do a little worse. But overall, we're on the downward spiral here. We're doing good inflation is going down i hope that wage increase comes my way i know know. yeah i know we all do don't (laughs) um but yeah wages are up so that is that is always awesome to see especially after 2022 i mean 2022 was so bad for median household incomes oh yeah so now finally seeing that we're on the upper end of that and you know what this union activity is going to help that Definitely. Right? This union organizing, 150,000 workers, that's going to impact median wages across the country for sure. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's awesome to see. Uh, What do you want to go to next? Well, let's keep on wages with this Republican bill to raise the minimum wage. Wait, what? Yeah, what? Republicans want to raise the minimum wage? Is Am I in a different world? I thought they were neoliberals. I could have sworn. I could have sworn. These guys, I thought they were for a free labor market, these liars. Yeah, what the hell? Um, so as as many of us are well aware, the minimum wage is currently at $7.25 an hour. Nationally. Nationally. Yeah. Um, that is the lowest amount allowed by federal law. And it's been there since around, two, I think it's since 2008. I think Obama raised Seven it once. Seven or eight. Seven or eight, right? Yeah. I don't even know if Obama ever did. It might have been Bush near the end. I'm just going to figure look, this out. Look that up while yeah. I'm talking. Um, but Republicans want to raise the minimum wage. Now, Democrats have been fighting for this for a long time. 2009. 2009. So there you go. Was was Obama. Um Democrats have been fighting for this for a long time. They've been fighting to raise the wage to $15 an hour. The fight for 15 has been one of the most prominent labor movement activities of our lifetimes. Um, Now people are working for a $17 minimum wage. Bernie Sanders is now pushing for a $17 minimum wage because if you adjusted the inflation, if you adjusted the fight for 15 for inflation as the inception of the fight for 15, now it would be $17 an hour. So yeah, the fight for 15 as a great slogan, but it's going to keep going up as inflation goes up. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, Republicans want to raise the minimum wage, but to $11. But they do want to do something interesting that I do like. They want to then tie it to inflation forever. That so, is very good. So they want to put it at $11 and then tie it to inflation forever. Hmm. Now that ends the political football that is minimum wage increases. I think the problem is that we don't want to put it at 11 and right. tie it to inflation forever. We want it at 15 at least, right. 17. That's preferably. what we want. We want it tied. Honestly, we want it tied. This is a very common like liberal leftist talking point online. But if, if, you, if wages kept up with productivity, the minimum wage would be like $25 an hour. Yeah. Right. That's what it would be. Totally. If wages kept up with inflation since 1968, if the minimum wage kept up with inflation since 1968, we would be at 14, 15 an hour. Mm. So that's why you kind of want to tie it to that number. Right. Um, Then putting it at 11 is not enough buying power. Exactly. That's not enough to live off of. That's the problem. You can't. I mean, even if an individual would live off of it, a family definitely couldn't live. No, off. absolutely not. And look, 725 is a nightmare because like you literally can't afford a median apartment yeah. anywhere in the entire country. Um $11 an hour might change that in Wyoming, um maybe Alabama, but yeah. I don't even think that does much in Indiana, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it's just hard. But uh who is signing this bill? So the people who are leading the charge here are Tom Cotton from Arkansas and Mitt Romney from Utah. These are Two very fiscally conservative guys. Mm-hmm. Now, Mitt Romney has like mulled over some stuff. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm for child tax credit. But Tom Cotton is not. Tom Cotton has never been for any economically populist or economically you know, pro-working class thing as I've ever seen. And now he's fighting to raise the minimum wage. But the caveat to all of this. So not only is it $11 when a lot of Democrats want it to be $15, $17, they're also making this an immigration bill which is kind of the compromise, the grand bargain that they're trying to make with this. So the legislation would penalize employers who knowingly hire illegal immigrants and violate I-9 paperwork rules. It would also require workers aged 18 and above to provide a photo ID for verification and basically implement the e-verify system across the country. 
uh, nationally mandated. Now, we've talked about how immigration is good for the economy at mm-hmm. length. That's one of the one of our, I think, best deep dives that we've done. Agreed. Please check it out. Yeah, please check that one out. Um, so there are some massive downsides to cutting out the illegal immigrants from the labor market. They are 5% of the country's overall workforce. So do you think that the United States could actually sustain a 5% reduction of our overall workforce? Absolutely not. We already are in a labor shortage right now. If every single unemployed American in the country got a job, there would still be 4 million unfilled jobs. That's insane. So the last thing we need to do is get rid of more workers. It's crazy how badly we need immigration. So the answer to this is very simple, right? The answer to this is, we'll make them legal, have them pay their taxes like everybody else, Mm -hmm. and let's get on with it. So, But there are specific industries that would be totally destroyed if this were to pass. Mm -hmm. Hired farmers. Hired farmers, 53% of them are undocumented workers. Construction, 15%. But I'm going to repeat that number. Hired farmers... 53%, 53%, more than half. Yeah. How do you think that these farms are going to function without this labor? This is not going to be sustainable. Mm-mm. The answer is to just naturalize these people and let them join the economy. They're going to be here no matter what. They want economic opportunity. They're begging for the chance to work. And we just have to give it to them. And uh, the Center for American Progress um, did a study And was kind of uh, trying to find what wage impacts and what long run impacts over the next 10 years would happen if we naturalized all current undocumented workers in this country. Well, they would see uh, undocumented workers would see a $14,000 increase in their wages over 10 years. Uh, uh, Annual wages for native born workers would increase $700 over 10 years. Native workers would see their wages increase 1.1%. You heard me there. Increasing immigration raises the wages of natural born citizens. Yeah. So it is not the case that illegal immigrants and immigrants generally take your jobs and hurt your job opportunities and lower your wages. That is not true. Yeah. I need to make that explicitly clear. It raises the it, it increases the size of the pie in the best possible way. Mm-hmm. It makes it so natural born citizens are more likely to get promoted and reach higher value added jobs yeah. and the immigrants come in and take lower value added jobs. Yeah, it's we I saw some Instagram comments that we got that said that the solution isn't more immigration, the solution is the farmers paying more. And of course, if these immigrants come in legally, then it means they'll have to be paid the minimum wage and they will be paid more. So one, that helps. But also, this is where you need to think of it more from a behavioral economics perspective rather than just an economics perspective. Because while money is going to entice people, no American kid grows up wanting to work on a farm doesn't work anymore none maybe they grow up wanting to run a farm or maybe they grow up wanting to do food science or have their own farm exactly but no one grows up wanting to work a farm that isn't theirs so that is why there are still enormous labor shortages right now impacting farmers that is why we need to invest in establishing a more robust legal immigration system to bring these immigrants in um, and you can say similar things about, to a lesser extent, about the the industries that are lower down or the types of jobs that are lower down in this list, right? Mm-hmm. Like construction and like production. Even though more Americans might be more okay or more excited to go and work in those jobs, not enough of them are to fill the positions. And that's why we need to be okay and more than be okay. We have to embrace bringing in all the people who are going to be excited to work those kinds of jobs like all of the immigrants that are coming from venezuela to escape their socialist authoritarian government because the increase in their quality of life coming from that situation to being a person working a farm in the u.s will be enormous right 
Right. Like that, their their life will change dramatically, and yours will still get better. Exactly. It hurts nobody. Yes. And it, it's we got again. We got these comments that like you guys don't understand the working class's issue with immigration. No, I understand the working class's Im- issue with their immigration. Problem is they've been lied to. The, yes, yes. They've exactly. been lied to. It's not true. The GDP would increase. The number of jobs would increase. Yes. I want you to th- guys to think about this. During the mass exodus of Cubans from the island of Cuba into Florida, people thought that Florida and Miami would go into economic destitution because it wouldn't be able to absorb all these immigrants. They thought that it was going to be the end of a booming economy in Miami, okay? That didn't happen. Three years later, all the Cubans perfectly integrated into the economy, created businesses, created more jobs, worked for native born people, and everyone was better off. It isn't a ship that you add more people on and it sinks deeper and deeper into the water. We are the water, okay? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yes. And the more people you have in it, the stronger your nation and the stronger your economy is going to be every time without fail. It is one of the most harmful misunderstandings or miscommunications that I can imagine American media has ever done. Like we are purposely actively hurting our economy for no good reason for no good reason other than racism right like that's that's the well, that's why i said for no good reason yeah there you go like that's the reason people are going i know i know the working class and a lot of people who have this concern of immigration don't view it from a racist lens no but the people who are lying to you do mm-hmm. steve bannon who writes breitbart has that intention mm-hmm. laura ingram on fox news has that intention the people pushing the great replacement theory are thinking that way. Absolutely. So don't be fooled by it. But let's let's rewind. Let's go back to this minimum wage thing. Yeah, yeah, God. Because no, it's important because this is this is honestly an immigration bill. Yeah. This is an immigration bill disguised as a minimum wage increase. Yes. That's what this is. Mm-hmm. Would you be okay with a minimum wage law being tied to immigration reform? Um I think I think I could be okay with this. I think I could be too. Because I think positive legal immigration reform could come after this. I don't think this bars that. No, totally not. I think that this bill, if we change that 11 to 13, and then we naturalize the citizenry and then increase border funding a lot, I think I'm in on this bill. Mm. If we could say, okay, let's naturalize everybody who's here and then we'll toughen up the border and we'll make it easier for people to immigrate legally and we'll raise it to $13 an hour and stick at inflation forever, I think you have me on board. Oh, to- I mean, that's the. I'm not upset with anything. Here's the thing. 13 I- number is the thing that would get me upset, right? Because it's not 15 or oh, 17. Oh, because it's low? Right. I-, I thought you were... No, that, that's, the, that's the issue part with what I said. Sure, but I'm still. Well, again, I assume that eleven is still better than seven twenty-five. Of course, and I don't. I mean, I don't know. Does this mean that it has to oh, be stuck true. at eleven adjusted? No, for you're right. Right, it doesn't. Yeah. So the only the only real problem here is the the barring illegal immigration, which again is fixed if we just make less immigration illegal. Yep. Yep. Yep, there you go. So yeah, I'm I'm okay with it, but my goodness, do the Democrats need to start being louder and pounding the table for pro-immigration? No, it, look, it's not oof. popular. So I'm reading this book right now called The Last Politician, and it's a summary of Joe Biden's first two years in office. And he says all the time that the last thing that he wants to talk about and deal with is immigration because he's scared of it, as he should be. It is the most politically divisive issue. Every time we post a video about immigration, we get downvoted and hated on in the comments, even though all we're doing is reporting the evidence of research. Mm -hmm. That's all we're doing. We're not even making a value judgment on the, like, on a better multicultural society. We're not even talking about any of that. No. We are only talking about the quantitative evidence that's in front of us. Yes. That's literally it. The economic gain yeah, there is that li- everyone will enjoy. That's We're not even touching the cultural stuff It's because it, it's not what we do. Mm-mm. We're not a cultural warrior attack show. We're no. not about the culture wars. That's not what the show is. Mm-mm. We're a very quantitatively driven show, right? But Joe Biden, in, his, in this book, has said all the time, I don't want to go near it. I don't want to talk about it. He gives it to Kamala Harris to deal with Mm. because he knows that it's a shit show and he doesn't want it to be his problem. Um, 
and it sucks because we need more warriors on this issue. We need more people ready to say the things that need to be said. Yeah. We need people going to press conferences, like Ben was just saying off camera. We need people going off press conferences every single day, making it very, very clear that the longer we wait to increase our immigration, the lower your wages will be over time. Yeah, we need we need someone who is on this like Bernie is on the fifteen dollar minimum wage. Yeah. Right. We like AOC is spearheading the sunrise movement and is the face of that. We need someone who's going on MSNBC, on Fox, on CNN, and even on all of these podcasts and YouTube channels, right? Who's saying, yeah, this is all of the evidence. This is why it's so clear that we need it to happen. And just have the facts so that if anyone comes at you with different arguments, you can be like, nope, wrong, nope, wrong, nope, wrong. It's better. It's good. It's helpful for the country yes you know what on the description of this youtube video that we post i'm gonna put a document in there that's gonna contain all the links to all of this information so whenever you see someone online talk about this you can copy and paste the document and respond to it in a comment yes so you can keep pushing this information out as much as possible mm -hmm. on the last migration video we put out i wrote the same response to eight different people all of, with the exact same links. And I'm like, I understand your concerns with immigration. Here is where you have been misled. Eight links. Yeah. I'm like, please respond to me if you have any questions. That's awesome. That's what we have to do. Yeah. That's how we have to get the message out because the media is failing us. Yeah. Just keep slapping them in the face with the truth. Yeah. And it just, it, yeah. I just, God, will it work? I don't know. But please keep trying. This is the only way. Like, that. it's the only <laughs> chance. Yeah. What's the other, what's you the alternative? You just have to keep pushing it. Yes. Yeah. So, Republicans raising the minimum wage, immigration reform is what they're trying to do with it. Um, it's not going anywhere. But it is interesting that they, they're they kind of carving this idea of like, okay, guys, well, we'll raise the minimum wage if you do immigration reform. Yeah. So this might be this path to it, which I think is interesting. Definitely. Right? I it might agree. be cool. Um, do we want to go international? Do we want to go local politics? Where do we want to go? Um, we let's stay local. Let's end with international. Okay. So let's go to Pennsylvania? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So we have some special elections today, which is like Christmas for me. Whenever there's an election, I'm like, oh, baby, let, 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 let me sit in front of my computer all night, watch those numbers tricking in. Let me, let me go to all the precincts and count the number of houses that I can see on Street View. I am a, I, I'm a fiend, okay? We had a whole conversation before this podcast <laughs> about whether we were going to talk about this no, because I was arguing that it's too irrelevant. I know, but it's not. Please, it's not. <laughs> People out there care. Listen, one of, the, one of the things that I wish was on YouTube more is content about these special elections <laughs> and what they mean. But I think that might be, I mean, we'll see. We'll Maybe say. this blows up. If that I was cool. going to say, this might be a niche of one. Oh, man. That you're targeting. No. no, prove them wrong, please. I'm begging you. Okay. <laughs> prove the haters wrong. Okay. So we have a Pennsylvania special election tonight, and we have an election tonight in New Hampshire. Go over the Pennsylvania one first. We'll try to be quick about it. So voters in Pittsburgh will be, decide, will be deciding the balance of power in the Pennsylvania House in House District 21. So this is really interesting. Um, the Democratic candidate is actually a former staffer for Chuck Schumer and has worked with Hakeem Jeffries in the past. Um, and the Republican, Erin uh, Connolly, uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name, was the chairwoman of a local party near Pittsburgh. Mm. Now, this election is not is important because it is it decides who controls the Pennsylvania State House. Now, this is important because Josh Shapiro, the governor, um, needs allies in the legislature to get some of his uh, agenda passed. The Republicans still control the state Senate, but this is important for Pennsylvania politics generally. But it's also important for national politics because the results of the Pennsylvania election here and getting the temperature of where Pennsylvania is will tell us how they are viewing the Democrat and Republican parties more generally. So when a Democrat is in office, you would expect Republicans to do better in special elections. And when a Republican is in office at the presidential level, I mean, you would expect Democrats to do better in these special elections. But what's been interesting in this year, we actually see Democrats overperforming the 2020 results in special elections. Mm -hmm. So on average, Democrats have been performing 5.8% better in special elections over their 2020 margins. 
This is indicating a democratic environment, okay? But not just is it important for the nationally. It's important for Pennsylvania to know where they are because Pennsylvania has a massive abortion battle going on in November. Mm. The uh, A seat for the state Supreme Court is up for grabs. The Democrat who is running has vowed to protect women's reproductive rights and is running against a Republican who has promised to defend all life under the law. Now, I will say the Republican running in this Supreme Court uh, race is fairly moderate. So I'm not going to pretend she's this massive right wing, super pro-life crazy because she isn't that and I don't want to misrepresent her. But it is important for the longevity of of abortion rights that more pro-choice people are on the uh, or on the court, especially in Pennsylvania, which is a swing state and can have Republican governors and legislators for time to time. But what is so exciting is we now have the election results from this uh, Pennsylvania race, which was literally just called three or four minutes ago. So the Democrat has won and has overperformed Joe Biden's margin by 7.5%. Mm. That is better than the 5.8 average we have seen over the course of 2023. Now, what's good about this from a Democrat perspective is that Pennsylvania has been one of the weaker states in these special elections over time, over this year, uh, for Democrats. The average uh, Pennsylvania Democrat overperformance was only 4.5%. So the fact that Penn, that this race went to 7.5 is even showing movement in the favor of Democrats in Pennsylvania specifically, um, which is a good sign for Democrats nationally and was a good sign for Democrats uh, in the Supreme Court race coming up in November. This is also good for Democrats in Pennsylvania because uh, Pennsylvania is a key state for Biden's reelection campaign and Democrat parties have been doing poorly with fundraising. Democrat parties across the state of Pennsylvania have been shedding people uh, from their payrolls. They have been firing people like crazy, and it does not seem like they have the infrastructure that's going to be necessary to run a presidential campaign mm. in the state. Um, and they've been worried about that. And they've been worried that this is going to impact the voting in November, worried that they're, it's going to impact their special election results throughout, uh, throughout 2023. And it, this result is looking like they are in a good position and will keep being strong. Now, briefly, I want to talk about what's going on in New Hampshire. Um, in a New Hampshire district, the Democrat, uh, which was just called an hour ago, the Democrat has overperformed Joe Biden's margin by 12.2%, indicating that you know, Biden is continually strong in the Northeast, uh, which is standard. But it's also a sign that Joe Biden's coalition is more educated and whiter than Democrats past, I think. Really? Yeah, because New Hampshire, these New Hampshire, these areas used to be more Republican. This is actually, this New Hampshire seat actually voted for Trump by 0.4%. Interesting. This is a Trump district that is now voting for Joe Biden by 11.8, or sorry, voting for the Democrat 11.8. Okay. So Trump 0.4%. Democrat 11.8. Interesting. So it's a massive overperformance for Democrats, and it's a swing. Um, I did not expect a swing district to go this much in Biden's favor. What, do you have or, any reason to think of why that that is? The only reason I could suggest is the Republican coalition is no longer a frequent voter. And frequent mm -hmm. voters are more likely to come out in special elections. Yeah. So... The frequent voters are educated, they are white, and Joe Biden is, they are educated, they are white, they are property owners. Those are the frequent voters. If Joe Biden is able to cut into those numbers and is able to get more educated, get more white voters, get more property owners, if he can really nail into those suburbs, Republicans are going to have a hard time winning anywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to pretend that suburban whites in New Hampshire are the same as suburban whites on Long Island, New York, because they almost certainly not. Um, suburban whites in New Hampshire are way more socially liberal than uh, suburban whites in Long Island. So I'm not even going to pretend that they're equal here, but it at least shows somewhat of a trend. 
And so I don't expect suburban whites on Long Island to follow through a 12% Biden swing or a Democrat swing. I don't expect that. But maybe it could mean a 3% swing, a 2% swing. It says something. And so now the, the, the average for 2023, there are no more special elections. These are it. There are no more special elections for 2023. The final 2023 average is 6.1% Democrat overperformance. This is in line with what we would expect when a Democrat wave year. This is not what we would expect in a neutral year, especially when a Democrat is in the White House. Yeah. This is a really great sign for Biden's reelection campaign. But what's interesting is that it contradicts the polling data we have. If you look at the polling right now, especially what came out this week, we have Biden 50 percent, Trump 49 percent. We have tied polls up and down. The real clear politics average has Trump above Biden nationally. How does that make sense with these special election results? What is going on with our polling methodologies? Honestly, I trust these special election results more than I trust our polling methodologies. Of course. Yeah. I would trust the special election results way more because these are actual votes. Yeah. These are actually the people who care to go out to the ballot box and vote. Mm -hmm. And I think these are more important. So a 6.1% overperformance, if this happens nationally, if, if, a, if, if Democrats perform 6.1% over what they did in 2020... We're talking about Texas flipping. Yeah. Right. That's and where we're at here. We're talking about the Democrats keeping control of the Senate, taking control of the House, getting Biden getting reelected and having taking Texas, taking Florida. Uh, I mean, that's insanity. Taking North Carolina. That's insanity. Yeah. That's insanity. If this happens nationally, that's what would happen. I don't expect that. I mean, maybe this could mean a 4% overperformance, but even a 4% overperformance is insane. Yeah. If you get a 4% overperformance from 2020, you win North Carolina, you change the map. You keep the Senate. Yeah. You make it really easy for John Tester to win in the Senate race. You make it really easy for Sherrod Brown to win, right? So just incredibly good news all the way around. Just incredible. So that is going to be the end of our special election talk. And uh, next, honestly, dude, September 27th, we got to stream the debate. Yeah. We have to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm okay. excited for that. That's going to be so fun. So there we go. Okay. So then our last current event we want to talk about. International. Yes. Israel-Saudi Arabia relations. So oh, this should be easy to talk about yeah. and not controversial at all. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> this has been cooking for a few months now. Uh, the U.S. is interested in normalizing relations between these two countries. Um, and honestly, it wasn't super easy for me to find out why at first. This is another example of like media not being super clear about what the problem is. Like, why do each of the parties want what they want? But from what I can tell, the U.S. wants stability in the region because one, it's already militarily committed to Israel and it's worried about needing to send troops there, there and invest more of their military technology if a war were to break out. Um, it deters military action from Iran, which I'm going to need to get into a lot more. To That's talk a about whole that. other thing. Yes. And what is kind of easier to comprehend, they want to bring these countries into their sphere and not let them get closer to China's sphere. Yes. They're trying to do this whole... Biden has been pushing this whole economic union between the Middle East, India, and Europe, and really just trying to make a block an economic zone yeah. that is tight in between these countries away from china we're talking about a rail network from europe down to india right yeah and, which goes through israel exactly yeah um so the reason this is coming up up now that we're talking about in the current events is because there's a u.n summit happening right now and biden is going to be speaking with the leaders of both countries um crown prince mohammed bin salman of saudi arabia and president benjamin netanyahu of Israel, Saudi Arabia is a little skeptical. So Saudi Arabia has been anti-Israel for a very long time. They actually historically haven't recognized Israel, instead opting to recognize Palestine because Israel is the Jewish country in the reason, region, right? And every other country around it, including Palestine, is Muslim. So makes sense why there's a natural disconnect there. Uh, but Saudi Arabia does want a defense pact with the U.S., which is really the main reason that these talks are even happening. 
Saudi Arabia has looked at what the U.S. has done with Japan and South Korea, where basically they're like, you play nice and you have good trade deals with us and then we'll come we'll agree to protect you if anything ever gets hazy around here right if china comes knocking at your door so saudi arabia is looking for a defense pact with the us they've seen what the us has done with japan and south korea where they have an agreement that essentially they can freely trade with japan and south korea and they don't make any fuss in east asia militarily um and in response the us will protect them if say China comes knocking and they want to cause some problems of their own. Saudi Arabia wants this because Iran is right on their door and Iran and Saudi Arabia don't get along well at all. In fact, Iran doesn't really get along well with many of these countries, including Israel, which is why Israel was very excited for this, for the U S to agree to defend them several decades ago. Uh, so that's why Saudi Arabia is interested in having these discussions. There's still, it seems like there's a long way to go. It seems like uh, it's not because Saudi Arabia has been historically so anti-Israel, a defense pact might not be enough to bridge that gap. But there is a bit of a change because... Mohammed bin Salman is a member of the younger generation of the ruling class in Saudi Arabia now, and they have been a lot less concerned about Palestinian rights uh, and their own territorial sovereignty. So this is what's currently going on. Conversations are going to be happening. I don't know if there's going to be a deal, but the Biden administration does seem pretty set on it and willing to spend political capital because Iran, I don't know, Saudi Arabia does seem fairly scared of Iran. I think it might go through. I'm, I am, this is a hard position for Biden to take. I don't know if I agree with it. I don't like Saudi Arabia as a country. Mm. They're a theocratic nightmare. Mm. They are as antithetical to my belief system that I it could ever be. I mean, so is Israel. That's what I'm getting. Honestly. Oh, well, that's kind of what I'm getting at here. Sorry. So Saudi Arabia is almost a, is uh, antithetical to everything, I think, right? Israel is at least a democracy. There are, there are elections. There is a parliamentary system that I like. There is a constitution that I think is sound. There is a Supreme Court system that I agree with that ben Netanyahu is trying to gut, which I disagree with, but what currently stands I agree with as an institution— now, what Israel does to the Palestinians is nothing else other than apartheid. They systematically oppress and destroy Palestinian communities and people um, with the expansions of their settlements into their territories. And Biden choosing to align the United States with a theocratic nightmare dictatorship that is Saudi Arabia— and then try to normalize Israel on the international stage under the pretexts that nothing needs to change in regards to their settlement policies, it seems like we're rewarding two bad actors for nothing. Yeah. That's what it seems to me. It seems like we're giving these two bad actors gifts. And what does the United States get in return? Def uh, defense from China? Restriction of China's rights of uh, economic opportunity? Oil? From the Saudis? Audi from the Saudi, oil from the Saudis, but oil, oh God, I am sick of relying on the Saudis for oil. Yeah. They are unreliable partners. Totally. They are so frequently unreliable partners that we should not be even thinking about them in regards to our energy policy. We should be, our entire energy policy should be trying to subvert them, totally. not to align or join them because they're not trustworthy partners on the international stage. So I don't like that Biden's big move, it seems, at this UN summit is to align himself with two, one proto-dictatorship and one dictatorship. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that speaks to Joe Biden's liberal values. Joe Biden, during his speech at the UN today, um, he opened it up with reminiscing over the United States and Vietnamese relationship and expressing joy and 
the beauty of United States veterans shaking hands with North Korean veterans of the Vietnam War and exchanging gifts from the war. And he's like, look how far we've come. Um, anything can be put past us and we can move on from the traumas of the past. That's a great message to open up a speech with. I, it was awesome. Then he talked about our values and the values of democracy and the values of liberalism and the values of the international world order and what it means to be a part of a liberal and democratic community. How can he say all of that and then make a defensive pact with Saudi Arabia and Israel? Mm. How can you do that? How can you speak out of both sides of your mouth? Because it makes me look, makes me feel, makes me feel like you're being disingenuous and makes me feel like you don't actually care about the values you preach. Now, I don't think that about Joe Biden. I think Joe Biden does have a true belief in these liberal values. And after reading a lot of interviews in this book, where we're talk, where we have quotes from Joe Biden and his people, it, I, I think he believes these things. But he has to f- deal with a real politic focus on this international stage mm-hmm. where he's aligning himself with dictators, and it sucks. It's nuanced. It's nuanced because he can't force them not to be dictatorships. He can't force democracy onto these countries but he doesn't have to give them guns no but i don't i mean i don't think that's really what's being talked about in the agreement when you say defensive pact like south korea and japan it's it's we're gonna plant military bases here. well yeah well that's that 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 is a ma- well then that means that saudi arabia doesn't have to spend as much money on their defense which is a massive gift to them yes right so yeah but it's not the same as giving them guns. Okay, that's fair. I don't fair. think. No, I maybe mean, you could say they could use that money to buy guns, but I don't think, I think the whole point is they're, they're not going to. Okay, maybe no, that's fair. But guns. like, why are we putting American lives on the front line of mm. Saudi Arabia of a dictatorship? Well, but this reminds me of Cold War policy. We propped up so many dictators and fascist leaderships mm-hmm. in, during the Cold War to combat Soviet Union. And I don't want to repeat that strategy with China. Sure. I want a, a larger liberal ideology to combat China. Okay. I don't want to have to deal with dictators to combat China. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I agree with that. I wonder, but again, it still does feel nuanced to me because do you think there is any value in us using our enormous strength to try to create more peace? Because like, if you're in Iran... And the U.S. has this pact with Saudi Arabia and there are military bases, American military bases in Saudi Arabia. Aren't you like, yeah, I'm I'm thinking a little bit more about going and attacking there. Yeah, but Iran has never attacked Saudi Arabia. I don't think Iran is going to do a ground invasion of Saudi Arabia. you got to use Iran. Otherwise, they're going to cast you oh, online. Oh, God, you're so right. Fuck. Yeah. It's Iran, right? Yeah. Okay. Iran has never invaded Saudi Arabia, and I don't think they're going to. What this would be is if Iran were to invade somewhere else, and the United States could quickly act because we have military bases in the region. You think so? Yeah. I don't think Saudi Arabia is ever going to cross... I'm sorry. I don't think Iran is ever going to cross the border into Saudi Arabia. But do you think... Okay, so you think the U.S. would actively get reinvolved with their troops that's the even only if, even if iran invaded a country that isn't one of them that the u.s has a pact with that is the only reason that we would have a defensive pact in saudi arabia that was that is the only reason we would have military bases there there is literally no scenario where iran invades saudi arabia it's not even possible why not like that's like a that's like a massive global war event that is not happening we come on no Dude, Iran is in not is no no, but but you have to but you have to understand that what you just said is in the backdrop of Ukraine. Yeah, well, that's a, a year and a half. Ago. We're talking about Russia. The Russia the Russian military size is not comparable to Iran's. Right. The, the point Iran doesn't have the logistical capability to ever invade Saudi Arabia. I mean, apparently Russia doesn't really have the logistical capability to invade Ukraine. That's fair. But I I I could see Iran doing something pretty irrational. I don't know. Look, I have other opinions. I think Iran is so preoccupied with what they're dealing with in Afghanistan okay. that there's no reason for them to ever look westward. Mm. Uh, I, obviously, they have ideological reasons for wanting to wipe Israel off the map. I'm not going to deny that. Mm. I, Iran is definitely committed to the destruction of Israel, and that is true. Um, 
So I, I, I'm sympathetic with that. I do not think that they have the same feelings towards Saudi Arabia. I do not. Um, one of these reasons that I don't think they even have the capability to invade Saudi Arabia is because that they are dealing with a water war on their Afghanistan border. Afghanistan is throwing suicide bombers at Iran right now. The Taliban is using suicide bombers. And I don't think that Iran is going to be able to be like, okay, we need to go fight this water war on the east, and then let's go invade Saudi Arabia on the west. It seems like it's a waste of U.S. resources for not a good enough reason. I think that's a fair I think that's a fair argument. Yeah. Um, and it does make me think, is there, is there any other U.S. <coughs> goal here? Like, is there another motivation? Or is it really mostly just we don't want them in China's sphere? I think, I think the only thing I can think of is that they don't want them in China's sphere. Maybe they want the oil from Saudi Arabia. Maybe they're trying... I mean, I know that they're trying to decrease the amount of Arab support for Palestine. That was one of Trump's greatest achievements. Yeah, near the end of his greatest achievements it was i mean that was one of his greatest achievements um near the end of his presidency the abraham accords where he got the united arab emirates and all these other uh arab countries to recognize israel and you know normalize relations mm -hmm. and basically back off their hyper support of palestine leaving palestine more and more isolated on the international stage um that is an american win unfortunately Okay. Right? And so this is definitely an American win if Saudi Arabia normalizes relations with Israel. Yeah. Because it, it, it further blocks the threat to Israel. It, it, it threat, it, okay, it blocks the threat to Israel yeah. from any other nation other than Iran. And it really puts Iran at the center stage of danger to Israel, mm. right? Um, I wonder, though. I wonder if it would provoke Iran in a way. In a way that kind of talks about Ukraine joining NATO might have provoked Russia. Yeah. Right? Like, we think that we're deterring people by widening our sphere, but maybe uh, the the Iranians become so worried that any window they have at, like, self-reliance, mm -hmm. independence uh, from the U.S., is closing too fast and they lash out. Yeah, I mean, listen, I disagree with that. I don't think Iran should view this as an offensive measure. No. Right? They no. shouldn't because it isn't. But it's but, a waste of American money. That's my big concern. Sure. No, but NATO, But my point is that shouldn't have been the view for Ukraine joining NATO either. Oh, yeah, true, true, true. But the, the problem is it means there's no chance of Russia having Ukraine in its sphere anymore mm -hmm. or in... Iran, like, joining forces with some of these other countries. Yeah, this is interesting, man. And Joe Biden and foreign policy, this is supposed to be his thing. Like, this is supposed to be what he is good at. This is really? what he loves the most. He, In the book, he talks, they talk all the time. Joe Biden loves shaking hands and calling foreign leaders. Interesting. He loves it. He loves the idea. He, he views international politics as a, a, as, a, as a rough family gathering. Interesting. Um. But it just makes me nervous tying yourself to dictators like this, you know? And so much of the Democratic base hates Saudi Arabia. So much of the younger Democratic base has problems with Israel. And then our guy, our guy, is now, you know, normalizing relations between the two countries and building up military bases in one. Is that the right move? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Mm. I don't think so. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> it's tough. I, like, I don't, I don't know where I land. Yeah, it is. It's hard. Because you don't want to give them to China. I definitely agree with that. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it seems like one of those things where like, we try to give solutions. We try to land somewhere on this, right? We don't want to just be the complainers, the yeah. critics. It's too easy to just be the critics. True. Um, but I guess we're going to be hypocrites in this case. I guess so, because I don't know what the right answer is. Maybe the right answer is to do nothing. But Maybe. Know, maybe. Yeah. All right. You ready for some depression, people? <laughs> you ready for some deep, deep existential dread? <laughs> That's what we've been facing up to this week. <laughs> On everything sucks, let's fix it. Um, so You got to use that voice more often. Yeah, my, my announcer voice. Oh, my God. Um, that was like a, you, wait, that sounded like a, like a, like an anime. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, I can go into that mode, I guess. Um, no, I, I, I tend to do better in... In mostly monotone, I think. You sounded, your your anime voice is better than the voice actors, the American voice actors for Attack on Titan. So <laughs> I give you that. That's a low bar, but I'll take it. <laughs> so we did the science behind climate change last week. 
talked about the greenhouse effect, what's been happening on Earth. Now we're going to talk more about the effects, mostly on people. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot. There's. We got into. We have like a little bit of effects here. Honestly, there are so many more effects on climate change that we probably haven't touched, and maybe we have a shallow understanding of. Uh, but we did go deep in a few ways, and a big one was migration. Yeah. Climate change is estimated to displace some 13 million people. Um, I think by 2030, that number is. It's going to do that in several ways. One is sea level rise. So sea level rise, I think, is one of the more obvious consequences of climate change. As glaciers melt, they fill up the ocean a little bit more and the sea begins to, to rise. And so Coastal communities are going to suffer more consistent flooding. We've already seen this in Libya, which we brought up last week. There was a massive flood that killed thousands of people, wiped villages away. Um, it's going to cause more extreme hurricanes and other weather events that's going to drive people inland. And what, what's going to happen, as far as I can tell, it's already begun to happen, is people are going to be driven to large population centers. Right, so think about somewhere like Miami. Miami is a pretty rich city, so a lot of people are going to be sheltered from these burdens. But for the poor in those cities in, in Miami who don't have the best infrastructure and whose homes are destroyed in these massive floods, they're going to go inland, but they're still going to want to go to population centers because they can find support there. So maybe they go north to Jacksonville or they go somewhere like Atlanta in Georgia. Um, we saw this in Katrina when New Orleans got wiped out. A ton of these people went to Dallas and Houston in Texas because mm -hmm. they could find support there and then they ended up never going back. So What's going to happen is the housing shortage that we're already dealing with in these places is going, going to get even worse. The people on the margin at the bottom are going to become homeless. And that is obviously going to cause, it's going to cause a lot more suffering and death. The rising sea level is so scary. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to affect, so the amount of people it affects in the United States, if, let's, let's start here. So... If we keep our goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius, then sea level is projected to rise 0.3 meters by 2100. That's by over the 2000 levels, okay? That's not that bad if we kept it at 1.5. But the scary truth is we're not gonna. We're not gonna keep it to 1.5. It's not gonna happen. And in a high emission scenario, which is what we are heading to, we are heading to a, a plus two degrees increase in temperature, um, we could see the rapid ice sheet collapse. If that happens, by 2100, uh, sea levels will rise by 2 meters. If sea levels rise by 2 meters, we will be talking about, estimate, 3,000 kilometers of land gone underwater. 3,000 kilometers. Number of people that would impact is around 2 million people. Okay, 216 million about, something like that. Okay. 216 million is a lot more than two. Yeah, no, 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 I know. Okay, two, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was going to say two, but it's closer to 216. Yeah. 216 million people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, global GDP, an entire trillion dollars wiped away yeah. with GDP um, because of this two meter rise. Mm -hmm. Even if it's only one meter, we're still talking about a, a, a close to a trillion in GDP loss. We're still talking about 145 people exposed. 145 million people exposed in the world. 2,000 kilometers of land gone under one meter. Even if we only cut that two meter in half. Mm -hmm. So this is coming, and this is something that we need to be ready to deal with. And what we need to deal with is the migration that comes along with it. Now, mass migration has caused a lot of political friction in the West, specifically in Europe. Obviously, we have our migration problems in the United States, but... Uh, Europe has faced a brunt of migration after the Syrian civil war. So mm -hmm. in 2015, 
mass influx of refugees and migrants were caused by political crises and an increased friction between European capitals as the bloc struggled to cope. Its institutions were broken. And now, eight years later, the European Union is faced with nearly 64% increase in unauthorized migrant crossings. And this is excluding the 8 million Ukrainians that crossed into Europe. Mm -hmm. So we're cutting out the Ukrainians because that's not a fair thing. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about 64% increase of people coming from the global south, coming from the Middle East, um, that is now moving into Europe. And these people don't have a choice. With the rises in heat, the Middle East will not be inhabitable to human populations by 2100. It, yeah. won't, it literally won't be. You couldn't survive. You would die. You couldn't be outside for more than 20 minutes without how hot it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. So now this makes me nervous because the only thing more dangerous from my perspective of a right winger, the only thing more dangerous than a right winger who doesn't believe in climate change is a right winger who does believe in climate change. A right winger who says no. Uh, climate change is coming and we need to put machine guns at our border so nobody comes the fuck in here. Mm. That's what scares me more than anything. Vivek. Vivek. Oh, God. Okay. So that's what we are, that's what we're going to be seeing in the future with um, the effects of climate change being coming more and more obvious and more and more like undeniable. Yeah. Right wingers are going to very quickly shift from climate change isn't happening to climate change is happening and we need to do everything we can for our country and make sure that nobody else gets in here yeah and thus that everyone else dies in their country yes that's what they that's what the right wingers are going to switch to very very quickly yeah um i mean victor orban of hungary was very quick to put up machine guns during the syrian refugee crisis yep i can only imagine what he's going to do in a climate crisis um and it's, it's just so scary yeah and the the scary thing too here is is it's going to lead to more and more civil unrest and the countries that already have the most civil and social unrest are so easily going to tip into war so another thing that i looked into is water wars yeah okay um really clearly dystopian thing that we are entering the thing is, clashes have already begun. We talked a few weeks back about a water war or a water skirmish that was happening between Iraq and Pakistan. I no, think. it was actually Iran and Afghanistan. It's the same water war I just talked about. Okay, that was actually our second episode. Really? Yep. Okay. Um, Iran and Afghanistan. They yeah they had a skirmish over water rights in uh, in a river. I'm not sure. Was it? I don't know what river it was. I couldn't pronounce it even if I knew it. Yeah. Uh, but now they're also happening between Iraq and Pakistan. Oh God! And and India and China. Oh my God! China has begun to dam the Indus River to restrict its flow to India. This clash ended up killing twenty Indian soldiers. But like they didn't want to escalate it, so it's not all-out war. But this is the thing: like these countries are going to continue to dam up these rivers further upstream. Right, they're going to hoard the water because droughts are going to become more and more common. The river flows are going to become less reliable, and as they hoard them, like when you have an a limited amount of resources like this, when we're when we're overusing them and um, polluting them to the extent we are, the natural step for countries is they have to militarily step in. They have to capture and defend these waters. So. What's going to happen is these communities that are the most vulnerable to conflict are going to delve into war. And that's what we already have in India and China. And what we've seen is in other communities, I'm forgetting the country. I can't believe I didn't write this down. Maybe I have it in my notes here somewhere. Um, but What continent? Uh, it's, in, it's in Asia. It's in like Central Asia. Uh, but one of these countries was like had better social cohesion. And so even though their drought, I think it was Oman, like Oman or yeah, Oman had worse droughts than, than a place like Iran, say, or Iraq, but social cohesion was a lot stronger in Oman. And so it had very little social unrest. Interesting. And people were able to just accept that they had less water to use, but in places where social unrest is higher and dissatisfaction is higher 
it has a greater effect when people lose water, right? And so you're going to have more uprising, more likely to have war between these countries. Uh, and that's really scary, especially when you have these nuclear powers involved, right? China, India, Pakistan. Pakistan. Oh, my God. No, yeah. it's, a, it's a scary situation. And you're saying these countries that have, don't have good internal political systems, right? Yeah. Well, we've talked about that internal migration from Miami to Jacksonville is going to be very prominent with the sea level rise. Mm -hmm. This is also going to happen due to heat. And this yep. is going to happen in Africa, specifically Western Africa, mm -hmm. in Nigeria, Senegal, and Niger. Oh, talk about political instability. How many times have we talked about the Niger coup on the show, right? Well, by 2050, 19.1 million people will need to internally migrate in Niger. In Niger. 9.4 million will need to internally migrate in Nigeria and 1 million in Senegal. Where do those 20 million people from Niger go? That that causes a complete destruction of the social system. Yeah, totally. Um, it, it's, uh, yeah, well, it just reminds me, like you're just saying, like we, we already see the problems, the populist uprisings that happen in response to mass immigration, mm -hmm. right? I think it's just going to be more of that. It's going to be more desperation to shake up these systems. And because of that, people are voluntarily going to give up stability because they're hopeful that instability brings better results to them, even though it's the thing that is almost most certain to bring bring worse results. Or I guess it's more it's more certain to bring worse results to more people. Yeah. But they figure if, oh, if I shake things up, then maybe the system changes in a way that I am one of the lucky few mm -hmm. who gets stability, safety, prosperity. Ridiculous. Yeah. Oh God. It's, it's where we are delving. We, the closer and closer we get to the destruction that climate change brings, the more and more human selfishness will make us a danger to ourselves. Totally. Right. Because it's only increasing scarcity. Another example of climate change negative effects is our food system. Yeah. Our food system, we've gone into a large deep dive about our food system. Another one of our best. One, yeah, it was awesome. You should go check it out because it was really one of our best. Um, and they're all so great. So that says something uh, because we're so smart. We're incredible. Um, this, the destruction of our food systems due to soil erosion, uh, due to flooding, these things are going to make states more and more nationalistic and more and more reluctant to participate in an international rule-based order. Mm -hmm. They're not going to want to do it because they're not going to see the benefits of it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. They're going to be so protective of everything they have because we're going to be living in such a time of scarcity. And fear. And Everyone's fear. just going to be scared. Like people are, countries are going to be hoarding because they're scared of a time when they don't have any left. Yeah. Right? So food, water are great examples. And even a country, like I can think of a country like the U.S., already China is a great example because China hoards so much food, enormous food stores. They have like a year's worth of food inside ready to go. Yeah, because they can't grow enough to sustain themselves and they're so scared of a time when they might be cut off. Uh, more and more of that is going to happen. And when that's happening, like you hit desperation points if you can't get the resources that you need, especially if you're transitioning mm -hmm. from a system where this trade is so free flowing, yep. which we've been in since World War II now. And so if countries, if the expectations have to shift where they, they can't rely on imports from other countries, you're going to put them in desperation mode. And really the only option they have to take is military. Yeah. They, they're only, they're only going to have reactionary political and military force to do anything anymore. Yeah. Because there's going to be no st international um, playground for everyone to play nice. Yes. Now, in Biden's UN speech today, he did a great job saying that we want to uphold the institutions we built after World War II, which is actually in another one of our deep dives. When we talked about neoliberalism, we went in depth about the different things that were built up during the end of World War II, the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations. Bretton Woods system. Bretton Woods system. And he talked about very explicitly changes he wants to see to the IMF, changes he wants to see to the World Bank, changes he wants to see to the UN. He wants to increase the number of 
people, the number of nations on the UN Security Council. Yep. He really wants to make fundamental changes there because he wants more countries to believe that the system can work even in hard times. Because yes. the truth is, we've been living in good times the last 50 years. Inequality is really bad between nations and even internally in the imperial core. Yes. But overall, poverty has been reduced and we have seen economic growth like you couldn't believe. We've seen a billion people get out of poverty because of this international rule-based order. Yep. And we have seen that now, what happens when that poverty reduction stops going so fast? What happens if these droughts and all these effects of climate change start impacting that? People are going to lose faith in this rule-based order real quick yeah. if they are not bought into it. So it's worked in the good times. Now we have to prove that it's going to work in the bad. And climate change is going to be that ultimate test. Yes. And it, and it only works if the countries that are the haves, the, the U.S., even a country like China, even though I wouldn't trust China to do this, but other Western European countries, it only works if the rich countries don't kind of fall one by one like dominoes, where they decide that they need to hoard their own resources, right? Absolutely. And it's going to be tough because internal bandwidth is going to be stretched, right, in our countries to there's going to need to be more government aid that's given as climate change adaptation and migration happens inside the U.S., mm -hmm. inside Great Britain, inside other European countries. Um, but we need to maintain our presence in the international system, our commitment to supporting that international system to maintain global stability. Yeah, I mean, think about it. there are going to be climate migrants if we do not build up Nigeria in the correct way mm -hmm. for them to sustain and reliably beat back the effects of climate change. So if you don't want people coming into the United States from these countries, be prepared to send money over there so they can fix the problems, right? Exactly. Um, one of the things that I like a lot about Joe Biden's immigration policy is he always talks about, especially on the campaign trail in 2020, even mostly in the Democratic primary, he talked about a Marshall Plan for Central America. Um, after World War II, you know, Everything was destroyed, and uh, we implemented the Marshall Plan where we just funneled money into these Western and Eastern uh, European countries to rebuild them after the destruction. We need to do something similar to the countries that are about to be impacted by climate change. We need, we need a climate Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. Yeah. Um, and until we get that, man, it is just going to be so hard. I liked what you said about how we need every country to not fall like dominoes into the into into the into the ire of reaction and fear, right? Yeah. It, because the second one starts falling, the next one down the line feels like they need to too. Otherwise, they're screwed. Yeah. Well, what's scary is I think the dominoes are really wobbly right now because this is the current white right wing populist wave, right? Mm -hmm. America first, right? It's it's France trying to keep out immigrants specifically from Muslim countries, or in other words, often poorer countries. Mm -hmm. They're already trying, like many of these countries are already trying to hold tighter to their own resources. They're trying to give up less and less the kind of, national philanthropy is decreasing yeah um in an effort to placate the the citizens of these countries and i mean if you're an american i i understand and what i said before about the ceos trying to hold on to their money for all of these individual actors i understand it this is why the leaders of our governments and our global systems kind of have to rise above that our systems need to be better than us as individuals yes and this is probably the best example that i could possibly imagine for that definitely i think i, I want to say one more thing and then i think we'll end it here we talked a lot about climate change and its effects here i think it's notable that we only talked from the political lens and the geopolitical we didn't go so much into like the environmental impacts generally right that's not what we do here we're not like belittling the effects that they have on the ecosystem and the death of all the species we really are only focusing on the human impacts we don't discount the ecosystem impacts but we're just talking about the human world. and i would say it's because anyone who really cares about the 
impacts on the ecosystem know about the pending e- impacts on the ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. Everyone else, the people who still need to be brought into the fold at all on this, need to understand how dire the effects on the human systems are going to be. Definitely. Definitely. I think that's it, guys. I'm good. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks, guys.